I'm struck every year by the timing of this feast, it's celebrating the Holy Family. It comes on the first Sunday following Christmas, when a lot of us have already started to have an overdose of family. In fact, after the parties and the cooking and visiting, obligations and expectations and maybe even disappointments, some of us have had about as much family as we can take. Parents begin to wonder when the kids are going back to school. A little togetherness goes a long way for every generation. But then comes this feast. We are challenged to look at what it means to be family. And our eyes turn towards the Christmas creche, the nativity scene. During this time of year, we tend to sentimentalize the Holy Family. They become figures of plastic and paper and plaster, not flesh and blood. But we forget they weren't all that different from us. They were holy, yes, but they were also human. And the story of the Holy Family is a story of life not always turning out the way that you expected. It's a story of a teenage mother conceiving a child before she was married. It's a story of an anxious father confronting scandal, even planning on divorce. As we heard in today's gospel, it's a story of a missing child in days of anxious searching by his parents. But there is even more. Mark's gospel describes an incident in which the relatives of Jesus were so alarmed that they thought he had lost his mind and set out to seize him. And not long after came his violent death, one his mother watched helpless, helplessly and with almost unimaginable sorrow. This family was holy, but it was also human. And we need these reminders, especially now. The church calendar shows us that the Christmas season is one of light, but also of shadow. The day after Christmas, we celebrate the feast of the first martyr, St. Stephen. And then a couple days later, we mark the feast of the holy innocents, the children slaughtered by Herod. The joy of Christ's birth is suddenly tempered by tragic reminders of what the incarnation cost. And the holy family shared in that. I saw that vividly just after Christmas. I was struck this year by something that hadn't occurred to me. I noticed the nativity scene, the Holy Family and the baby Jesus, and the pride of place that it has in this church. But just a few feet away, very close, there is the crucifix in the dying Christ. In the stable, the mother Mary looks down at a life beginning. At the foot of the cross, she looks up at a life ending. It is just a few steps here from the wood of the manger to the wood of the cross. But in so many ways, the two singular events are inseparable. One led inevitably to the other. Joy and sorrow are almost side by side, linked by sacrifice, by faith, and by love. It is the story of our salvation, and it is the story of the Holy Family. And the juxtaposition of those two images in this church, the nativity and the crucifix, serves as a powerful lesson for this feast. We realize that when we speak of the Holy Family, we speak of a family that struggled and suffered, like so many of us. But this family also knew profound hope. They trusted completely in God, and they call all of us to that kind of trust. And they are with us. In our own time, they stand beside all who worry, who struggle, who search, and who pray. The Holy Family stands beside parents that are anxious about their children, worrying about their welfare. They comfort young mothers and young parents. They console the prisoner, the outcast, the bullied, the scorned, and the parents who love them. And they offer solace and compassion to any mother or father grieving over the loss of a child. The Holy Family shares our burdens, but they also uplift us by their example. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were never alone. 
They endured through the grace of God. They prayed, they hoped, and they trusted in God's will. We might ask ourselves where we can find that kind of peace and purpose in our own families and in our own lives. One answer is in St. Paul's beautiful letter to the Colossians. This passage that we hear today is sometimes read at weddings. And like Paul's letter to the Corinthians, it speaks eloquently of love. But Paul wasn't writing about romantic love. This letter is about how to form a healthy and holy Christian community. And from his words, we can draw lessons about how to form a healthy and holy Christian family. Put on compassion, Paul tells us, and kindness, lowliness, meekness, patience, forgiveness, and love. It is all that simple and yet all that difficult. I'm sure the Holy Family had moments when living those virtues seemed hard, maybe even impossible. But they did things that most of us don't. They listened to angels, they dreamed, and they gave themselves fully to God. They made of their lives a prayer. When we find ourselves overwhelmed, we need to remember where we look today and remember to look towards the nativity. There is our model for living, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. But we need to see them in full, remembering the closeness of the cross. That was their life, and it's ours too. Yet through all their hardships, in a time of anxiety and difficulty, persecution and tragedy, a time very much like our own, they showed us how to be people of faith, people of forgiveness, people of love. They showed us, in other words, how to be holy.